idea was to do something invisible, as um, every th many uh, things have been already tried and already been realized in the in the past years. So if you are in this beautiful landscape, in this beautiful park, uh, one idea could be just to do something hidden below ground. Every time we, when we look at the, uh, the project we are doing together, we always try to ask the very essential questions so why we needed to do another building together, or what has been done before, what is the meaning to have a serpent time, to have this space, and how it would relate to our collaboration. Many things have been done in the past, 11 pavilions by all good architects and great projects have been realized, and so really the first instinct was we would not want to do another object so we tried to do something rather invisible or go underground. This uh, digging down of 1.5 meters and the raising of the roof by 1.5 meters should be such an integral part of the design and that that goes in tandem, of course, with the whole question of memory and archaeology. This vision of something that uses the underground, explores the underground, makes things on top, above, less visible and involving landscape rather than form. That was really a thing we shared, all the three of us. In this particular case, they decided they didn't want to create another object. And it's important that this is architecture, not art. It's resolutely a commission for architects. If you have an exhibition of architecture, one of the most difficult things to do, I find, is to read the models or to read the drawings, to understand the photographs, so you can really, in your mind at least, inhabit that space. And of course, the architects have been so sophisticated in asking us in our minds to remember. It's the memory of our context, the site of Kenton Gardens, and then there's a the memory of the past pavilions. What we have there are, is a palimpsest of the ghosts of these you know, 11 um, uh, pavilions. And it's actually 11 columns which ca characterize or represent the past uh, pavilions. And the architects have then added a 12th column, um, a 12th column, which is you know, their new pavilion. These 12 columns carry a um, steel roof, uh, a disc of some sort, which hovers a meter and a half of, you know, above ground and uh, is, is at the same time also a surface of water. So it's the ingredients are very simple. It's water, it's, it's steel, it's, it's cork. So there were traces, there were already geometries, different geometries, so the, all the, the, the forms that have been um, uh, developed by our colleagues. I can't help but think of um, the columns of the Sarno Pavilion, although they're much more robust now. I can't help but think of this, this whole thing of digging down, which of course Oscar Niemeyer did. The different levels and the colour, I think, of Olafur. Wood too was incredibly, it was the key um, material for the Alvaro Caesar and Eduardo Soto de Moura Pavilion. If we go back to Zaha's uh, canopy, I think of those incredible swooping forms. Then Daniel Leaveskind was an origami shape, which was all about drawing, and there again the drawing comes in through the revelation. So I think about it in a huge number of ways. Well, of course, the entertaining thing is it's fictitious archaeology, as I pointed out. It's, um, I forget who it was, but somebody defined archaeology as a systematic destruction of the remains of the past. Trying to make because it's a very 
very much come to the question why we have to do this and what the other people, you know, the, you know, did before. I mean, you know, architecture as a total effort, uh, as a history, as understanding of the, the, this kind of human uh, uh, structure. My own memory, when they started to suggest Cork for this pavilion, it came to my mind Joseph Beuys. You know, from the felt, you know, Herzog de Meuron used to the to the Cork now, and Cork is both a material and a place, as Cedric Price always said. There are very few materials which are also a place. Actually, I like it more now that I see it for a while. I think it works pretty well. And I also think that everybody loves the cork and is a, is a kind of an interesting material, it's a, like a mystery, it's something, it's something mysterious cork. It's natural, nobody really, or the very few people really know what the cork actually is. It feels good, everybody touches it. Very often people touch our buildings, actually. This pavilion landscape, this sunken pavilion landscape, level would be somehow 150 over your eye level. So you can see upon it, so you can also see the reflecting images in, uh, into this uh, water surface which acts um, like a mirror. 1851, 1960, 2012, for the Crystal Palace, uh, here, very near the Serpentine in Kensington Gardens, in 1960s, Cedric Price's idea of the Farm Palace uh, as a transdisciplinary uh, vision of a cultural institution. Crystal Palace, Farm Palace, we could maybe say Memory Palace, 2012, the idea of Herzog Dömer and Ai Weiwei to really you know, do an architecture of memory. My first impression was the focus of the space, I think, because it's monochromatic and then these lights and the lowness create this some, uh, sense of focus that you're waiting for something to activate the space. If you look at the different pavilions over the years, some of them have a very strong and intimate relationship to their location. And for me, the most successful ones are always the ones that make the most of that incredible setting. And the Herzog de Moran Ai Weiwei Pavilion undoubtedly does. You have this whole collage of memories of being in the different pavilions, the excitement of seeing them architecturally. So I think the lack of permanence of the pavilion really allows the sort of architectural imagination to be fired. Well, I spent 12 years of my life restoring the Noise Museum in, in Berlin, so I had a long um, you know, dialogue with, with memory. And I think memory is fundamental to our understanding of all things. Archaeology as, as a, as a um, symbol of memory and history, I think is profoundly important and I think that's what this is about. If it is claiming to be archaeology of the recent, um, that's a special one. I mean it's very difficult in London because London is full of archaeology. You know, I live in a street that purports to have had a Roman villa in it. I'm always looking for <laughs> evidence. Um, and it amuses me. Uh, as a child, I used to go and collect Roman settlements. The 2012 pavilion represents the working practices of both Herzog de Murren and Ai Weiwei. Both use history as a way of making something different, something new. Ai Weiwei has said of the 2012 collaboration, and it speaks for all three. My experience of working with Jacques and Pierre is that we never think separately. It's like three soldiers in a war, and that's a good feeling. We have a constant understanding of each other's practice and come together to create the support for the whole idea, making it possible. Maybe, maybe I can say something in that context. It is more than 10 years ago when Weiwei came with Ulisik and we became a group of friends who was traveling to China. I have one more very last question, which is actually um, about your collaboration. And we talked about the Serpentine Pavilion, we talked about memory, we talked about how you met. Um, we haven't talked about your dream, but I wanted to ask you today if you've got any joint, unrealized projects. 
Uh, in the future, you know, when she and Pierre are getting older, they cannot do architecture anymore. So maybe we can spend some time together. That would be a very nice uh, project. Yes, I would have said exactly the same That's thing. That's a very good answer. Well, I would have said exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs>